Every day, we are being scared out of our wits. And if we're not careful, our democracy will become a casualty. It used to be that the things that scared us were kept in the tabloids. Movie idols who became zombies, kittens that kill, alien babies, brainwashing, and the scariest of all, stars without makeup. But now, with the advent of social media and the 24-hour news cycle, we can be scared out of our wits every minute of our waking day. We can seek out what scares us, and we can spread our panic. How did the home of the brave become so fearful? Now, don't get me wrong. People can be scared about a lot of things. Loss of income, health threats, the unknown, failure. But when fear becomes the state of the nation, when we are encouraged to fear the very diversity that makes us strong, then democracy is an endangered species. As a professor of English and African American literature and African American studies, I asked myself, why in the 21st century are we experiencing a fear backlash? As a mother sending a child out in the world, I asked myself, why in the 21st century, after integration, after multiculturalism, after the election of a black president, are we experiencing a fair backlash? And then it came to me that these questions were older than the nation itself. We are fearful because we keep telling ourselves the same story, that there is a we made up of real Americans who have to protect themselves from a they, you know, those people. Sadly, history, art, culture, politics, law, all encourage us to think of this we as white. And that poses problem for a nation that was multiracial from the beginning. But let's take a look back and see how all of this came about. This we, they narrative is older than the United States, and it has its roots in cultural difference, social power, and control. The age of exploration brought many different people into contact, and race myths circulated widely. By the time English voyagers set sail for what would be the United States, race myths gave them belief in their own superiority, not only over Indians and Africans, but also over Irish, Welsh, Scots, and any other European ethnicity they thought beneath them. But as English settlements expanded because of the taking of Mer Native American land, and as African labor was brought in to work that land, the English realized it might be a good idea to have other European ethnicities buy into their we. And so a narrative began. How do you make sense of an ethnic hodgepodge various European ethnicities trying to be one unified country. How do you make wealthy Englishmen feel that they are the same as the Irish, Welsh, and Scot who they thought were beneath them and suitable only to be servants? How do you persuade indentured servants that they should join with wealthy Englishmen, even though their lives are not much better off than the Africans who were enslaved. The only way this could be done, the only way unity could be created along groups divided along lines of ethnicity and class is through the creation of a scary they that look different from Europeans. We hear of these pilgrims who set sail and with the grace of God, as they sought religious freedom, landed on the shores of an unforgiving land and conquered it. But even from the beginning, fear of those not like them was the undercurrent of this story. Indian captivity narratives painted Native Americans as savage and bloodthirsty. 
Sermons, treatises framed Africans as inferior and assured European indentured servants that because their skin was white, they would never be enslaved for life. Soon, the labels of English, Irish, Welsh, Scots fell away and were replaced by another term, white. And it wasn't long before that term was made synonymous with a new one, American. As the colonies merged into a nation, who was to be part of this we, these real Americans, were hotly debated. Should we be only wealthy English merchants and planters? Yeah, population numbers made that impossible. Should we incorporate indentured European servants? Uh, a dangerous possibility given class warfare, but maybe the least of the evils when you think about Indians and Africans. What was to be done with Native Americans? Move them westward. And Africans imported with the slave trade? Make them slaves for life because their labor was making the new nation very, very rich. The people we call the Founding Fathers fretted over the new makeup of this new nation. Benjamin Franklin worried about German immigrants and was saddened that the number of purely white people in the world was so, so small. Being a slaveholder, Thomas Jefferson trembled when he thought about the aftermath of slavery. In no way could he see blacks as part of his union. But demographics were never on Franklin's or Jefferson's side because from its beginnings, as settlements, as colonies, the United States was always multiracial. But a massive cultural machine made up of books, newspapers, magazines, museums, theater, even household objects combined to disseminate the false equation that white equals American. Just look at this 1893 Chicago World's Fair poster that shows a white Uncle Sam and his white partner, the goddess Columbia, giving permission for various European ethnicities and races all over the world to enter the miracle that is America. The whitening of American identity in popular culture was dangerous, but even more dangerous was when that whitening was made into law. Think about the real life effects of the various statutes that I'm about to speak about. The 13th Amendment did end slavery, but it left a clause that anyone convicted of a crime could be re-enslaved. That opened the door for states to institute black codes and what one historian calls slavery by another name. The many renditions of the Chinese Exclusion Act were motivated by fear of labor competition and race mixing. When Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 and incarcerated people of Japanese descent, 62% of which were American citizens. And the House Un-American Affairs Committee, they blacklisted authors, writers, artists, athletes, and essentially put creativity itself on lockdown. The equating of we and American makes our present look too much like the past. With a few edits, warnings against communists becomes warnings against 1950s civil rights workers, 1960s Vietnam War protesters, 1970s gay rights advocates. In 2016, just months after the election was over, Federal raids targeted people believed to be in this nation illegally, but legal residents were caught up in the net as well. Many cowered in their own homes across the nation. We are better than this. Fear can always be galvanized to make some group of they, but because the equation of white and American was problematic, it has always be con been contested, even by those who would have benefited from white privilege. While Franklin and Jefferson worried about the presence of different races and ethnicities in the new nation, politician Abraham Bishop wrote, 
We did not say all white men are free, but all men are free. The equation of white and American may have solved problems for those in the past, but it is of no use to us today. That equation is the threat to our national security. One might be tempted to say that our newest they are Mexicans or Muslims, but the funny thing about they is that as a category, it changes shape constantly. On Monday, they might be Arab women in hijabs. On Tuesday, Latinos at a bodega. On Wednesday, black men in hoodies. On Thursday, white women in pink hats. On Friday, queer partiers at a nightclub. And on Saturday, Native Americans trying to protect sacred land. The many arguments we have about equal access and immigration laws happen because some don't realize that the United States was never a white nation. Many races, many ethnicities, many lived experiences went into its making. All of us now must check fear at the border. We must take down walls that do not allow us to see lives beyond our own. We must silence the white noise of fear because it confines us on plantations, in internment camps, in detention centers, in the prison industrial complex. Fear never allows us to be our best selves, never allows us to see how connected we all really are. It closes minds to reasons, hearts to empathy, and a nation built on democratic principles is too precious to be undone by fear. If we must ban something, let's ban fear. It has no place in the future of this nation.